Hello, everybody. Um, uh, I never know what I'm going to say until I... Well, I was going to say until I stand up, but then I'm sitting down. Um, I want to talk about an extraordinary event. I was in uh, Palm Springs about four months ago, and I was going to TED Med, and we were in this dark room, and this woman came in and said, by the time I finished, you won't see the world in the same way. So beguiled as I was, as you would have been, uh, the room stayed dark and this woman started to play the most extraordinary violin. She was a concert violinist. But what was extraordinary about it was her husband was an electro engineer who had made this Perspex violin to project colors. And it was absolutely beautiful. In the middle, she stopped. In the middle of a piece of Paganini, she stopped and she said, what you're seeing is what I'm seeing, but in my head, I am a synesthesiac. I see music in color. And that was pretty amazing. But I went to the bar afterwards, and the really amazing thing was to be in a bar with maybe 200 odd people, and there were half a dozen people in that bar had all got together saying, my word, this is the first time in my life I knew that I was not alone, that there are others who see the world the way I see it. So that was the first amazing thing. But after she'd finished talking, I drove into the Joshua Tree Desert, which if any of you have ever been there, it's the most extraordinary place. And it got very, very hot. And I found a mineral store where I thought I would get a glass of water. So I stopped at this mineral store. And it had the most incredible sort of sign on the front um, saying coprolites available. For any of you who don't know what a coprolite is, it's a dinosaur turd. So this, this isn't the most common thing, you know, to find. So I went in, and as my eyes adjusted to the dark, I walked to the back of the store, and there, winking at me out of a cabinet, was something I never thought I'd see. And I said to the guy behind the thing, I said, is that what I think it is? He said, hey, Mac, it depends whether you think it is what it, I know it is. And anyway, two and a half hours I had spent later, I had spent a king's ransom on something I'd always wanted to own. It was possibly the most stupid purchase of my life, um, but it was a meteorite. It was a meteorite the size of a bowling ball. Now, this was really a stupid thing to do because I was going to fly out of LAX that night. And it only occurred to me, seriously, this is how stupid I am, it only occurred to me once I had already booked in and I was now through customs and uh, through passport control and waiting for my flight, when across the intercom it says, is there a Mr. Tim Smith in the building? They knew there was and they found me and I was taken into a side room where there were these four guys from customs looking at my case with all my dirty knickers and everything else and in the middle of it winking at me was this meteorite. Could you explain yourself, sir, he said. Anyway, it took only two minutes of explanation for all these guys to stop being security men and to be fondling my meteorite. <laughs> you may wonder where I'm going with this tale. You probably want big stories about sustainability, but you're not going to get any. OK, so I fly back into London after having been cleared, and my managing director from Eden meets me, and I say, look, I've got this bloody heavy meteorite with me. Do you mind taking it to Cornwall? because I've got to go to Leeds. That night, he phones me up and he said, if I had known what a babe magnet, a meteorite is, I'd have bought one when I was 20. <laughs> and he described his journey from Penzance, from um, Paddington to Penzance. He said, I put your meteorite in its rucksack on the table. It made such a clunk. The guy next to me said, what the hell you got in that? I said, it was a meteorite. He said, a meteorite. Can I f see your meteorite? So I showed him the meteorite. He said, over the next hour and a half, your meteorite was fondled by everybody on the entire train except for the driver. <laughs> so being rather amazed by this, I, we had an all staff, all 500 of my staff got together the following Monday, and I thought I'd try a trick. I thought I'd come on stage and I wouldn't say anything. I'd just hand the meteorite to the person stage right and say, just keep passing it along. Disaster. Three and a half hours later, I'm going hunting for the meteorite, and people are just holding this thing, and we started to talk about it. Now, 
You may wonder why I'm telling you about a meteorite, but it's really important. We, all of us are concerned with major issues and wanting to put the world to rights and all the rest of it. There are two things that I would say is one of the things I've discovered this last year is we're all very good at saying we want to live in a better world and we want to change things. That's really stupid. The, ch the word change is the most loathed word in the English language, so we should not use that. But anyway, we talk about a better world. But we're really profoundly lazy. No one actually describes what that better world is. It's kind of like motherhood and apple pie. What is this better world we want? What is it? And then you see an awful lot of us, and I, I, I blame myself. I'm not trying to make myself exceptional to this. But we've kind of persuaded ourselves that a better world is a world uh, where carbon isn't an issue. Unbelievably lazy. We'll talk about energy till the cows come home. We'll poison the world with other shit. But I mean, carbon, once we dealt with carbon and we talk about renewables and we talk about solar and whatever, we're all woven together like a magic carpet of ignorance because almost every, everybody I know doesn't actually know what they're talking about, but they know that it's somehow good and it leads to a better world. However, when you fondle a meteorite, when you fondle a meteorite and someone says to you, do you realize this thing was going around, you know, space? before Earth was Earth. People go all misty-eyed, and it's profound. Move forward to two months. I was invited um, to the Sierra Nevada mountains, and I was invited to climb the biggest tree on Earth. Now, I'm scared of heights, and it was only because I'm more scared of being thought a coward that I agreed to climb this tree. That sounds really fun funky, doesn't it? I climbed a really big tree. Actually, I didn't. I was dragged up by some much younger men. But by the time I got to the end, I'd already retold the story in my head. I had climbed it. And there at the top of this, this tree, this tree is so big that I know this is ridiculous nerdy maths, but if you cut it into six inch by one inch planks, it would go for 247 miles. That's how big this tree is. It's the, called the waterfall tree. And I, when I came down, I was speaking to this guy who had just made a billion dollars selling something. And he said, oh, I'd like to sponsor something. I said, um, what do you want to sponsor? He said, he said uh, well, I'd like to sponsor a bit of education. And I said, all rich bastards do. Because education, education is like a better world. We've all got a view about education and a better education. But actually, we don't know what we mean. We just know that we want to build care. Now, that giant sequoia that I climbed, it was 119 feet in diameter. It was over 4,000 years old. And it shared, it shared with the meteorite the ability that anybody who touched it felt something profound. Called it spiritual with a small s, but something which made us feel tiny. And being made to feel tiny, I think, is utterly crucial. Utterly crucial. Because if I was to be a provocateur in matters environmental, one of the things I loathe above all else, the biggest damage that has been done to the environmental movement has been predominantly men wishing to look like grown-ups and play with the boys in suits. And in doing that, they've committed a completely dreadful crime. They have bought into the notion that you can price the natural world. Haven't we all heard it? Natural capital. Let us, in order to sit with the people from the big four accounting companies and look like we know what we're talking about, let us show how much it would cost in an alternative way to have these trees make clean water, to hold the soil together, to stop erosion, to create oxygen. What have we come to that something that we invented, we invented money, we invented countries, and we're now pricing the value of the things that give us life itself as if it was somehow an A and B test. With Jonathan, I was on the advisory board of um, BP for their target neutral um, carbon offsetting thing. And you get the same ridiculous conversations there. So you are asked to decide to invest in renewables or not to invest in renewables on the basis of the current cost of fossil fuels. And all the grown-ups think this is a very smart thing to do. But then you say to them, hang on, isn't that a bit like comparing fresh mountain stream water with cyanide water? I mean, isn't it? Having already decided you don't want to have one, you're now pricing what that costs anyway against the other thing. And they don't get it. 
But because we price everything, we've actually fallen into a world in which we have becoming increasingly irrelevant. The environment movement has had its legs cut off because we decided to play by other people's rules. When you look at the big environment movement organizations in America, you might as well be talking to Donald Trump. <laughs> I'm serious, do you see me laughing? Seen what the, have you seen what the Nature Conservancy talks about? We are now in the age of the Anthropocene, and God don't our scientists love that phrase. We got a new thing to get paid for, a new thing to write books about, to get incredibly excited about humans creating a new geological era. To the point that the boss of the Nature Conservancy actually believes we are now gods. We are now in the position where what we say is what evolution is. And therefore, whatever happens, whatever happens is, of course, right. The loss of biodiversity is right because it's unsuccessful. More adaptation will take place. You've heard this argument, haven't you? The very fact that there are falcons on Wall Street, how ironic. There are falcons on Wall Street shows that adaptation knows no boundaries, doesn't it? So therefore, why the hell should we care? Why should we care? I mean, why do you get up in the morning? Why do I get up in the morning? Well, I get up in the morning because I actually just like getting up. It's because it's better than the alternative. And I've decided at the age of 62, I decided to stop having rose-tinted glasses about the world, but actually be really aggressive. Don't behave like an environmentalist. Shock people by just saying the unsayable on a regular basis. If only to make people think we, collectively are as guilty as those who we would seek to oppose. Because we have so many beliefs that we have put in our top pocket. That's who I am. That's what I believe in. You know, it's a bit like the guy in London who believes he's intelligent and is a thinker because he's read an article by someone cleverer than himself that he hopes someone else hasn't read. Education and thinking is flaming difficult. It's really difficult. And it starts with feeling. And actually saying what you stand up for is also really, really difficult. Because most people stand up for stuff because they, their mates stand up for it. They haven't thought about it. At Eden, we have these sessions, um, uh, the Eden sessions. And at the start of sessions, we often give people cards to fill in. Uh, a typical one might be, you're going to be executed tomorrow morning at 9 AM. Uh, but tonight, you may have the last dance of your life. What tune will you choose? Fascinating question, actually. It's a fascinating question because when you ask the question, the really fascinating thing is to stand on the hillside looking down and realizing that people are fascinated in other people's answers. I did this in a group of people. There were two teachers who had hated each other for 20 years to discover to their horror they liked the same song to be executed after. <laughs> it changed their whole view. I have never seen two people that looked less like they were capable of dancing in the street, but anyway, it was a remarkable thing. But the best question of all that we have ever asked is what do you hold strong and passionate feelings about that you know nothing about? It is a horrifying question. When I asked myself this, I realized almost everything I feel passionately about I know very little about. It's kind of instinctive. Is it the same for you? The same? Instinctive? Come on, let's be honest. This is kind of like confessional. Where you, wouldn't have, you wouldn't have come on a lovely day like this to a tent like this if you, we went on the same kind of side, would we? I mean, confess. How many of you actually understand the science of most of the stuff we argue about and we go to the wall about? Come on, hands up. We're doomed. <laughs> There's only one. Or at least admitting to it. Uh, sorry, the reason, so the reason, the, the reason I, I wanted to, to talk uh, here very much was because... I wanted to kind of reset a dial in my head with people that I know I have so much in common with to actually prepare or prepare conversations in which we explore, if you did have a limited time to live, what would you do? You see, one of the things I've noticed doing the Eden Project is that when you are supposedly an environmentalist and people say, wow, you get things done, everybody wants you to get things done and they give you all these things to look at that. And they look at you as if you've kicked a pet dog when you say, I haven't got time to do that. Because everybody has a pet this thing that they want to do. But if we had 10 years, say, let's say we were going to die in 10 years, what would we do? What would actually be really, really important? 
And I like asking myself that question on a regular, regular basis because you can actually get to sort of my age and realize you've pissed most of your life up against the wall on trivia. I don't actually believe I have, really, but there's an awful lot where with hindsight you write in why it was important. And I think there are some really important moments coming up for all of us. And I think the biggest and most important thing is to fight the notion of things being priceable. And I say that because I think it's very nearly too late. But I think the reason I'm becoming more and more convinced that that is what we must do is the moment that we concede that argument fully for the, first, for the last time, there's nowhere left to go. And we will have lost the battle and we will be irrelevant, completely irrelevant to any form of strategy or way forward. That's why with Eden, I've, um, I've agreed to do a number of things. We're doing 12 projects around the world. Ridiculous. They are about one and a half billion pounds worth of construction and they're all different. But they're all chosen for specific things to engender a response. I want to do things that engender a response. And I realized the only thing that I could do that made me engender a response was when I believed it enough myself. And the things that I remember about my youth are catching ladybirds and putting them in matchboxes or imagining fantastic beasts. So the first thing, the first project that I agreed to do is in Hobart, where we're going to build a center about Antarctica, but in it, you're going to actually run the risk of death. You have to sign a certificate before you're allowed in because it's going to go to minus 50 and there's going to be winds of 70 miles an hour. And when you've managed to survive that, um, you will go into a dark aquarium where you will see the creatures that live at the bottom of the ocean living under pressure. No one has ever done that before. And you'll see a wall of krill so thick you could walk across it. Why would I want to do that? Because I want people to go places and feel awe to go beyond price. That is why we're building in Qingdao, Yan'an, and Tian, uh, Tianjin in China. All huge projects, all looking at the world through strange eyes. Qingdao, it is water and the magic of water. We have two rivers the size of the River Thames on either side of the building. Everything is powered by water. On the loose plateau of Yan'an, we're trying to draw together all of the productive plants of the whole of China, and we've persuaded hundreds of thousands of Chinese people to join us in that project. And it's really exciting, really exciting. We're building in Squamish, north of Vancouver, with the First Nation American people, the Squamish. Why? Because I think we are living at the most exciting time in history. Do you know why? There have been more scientific inventions over the last 19 years than in the whole of the history of humankind. We're living at a time when the stuff that when I was living as a youngster, aged 19, was called hippie shit. We're living at a point when that hippie shit is being shown to be scientific truth. When you look at the microbes in our body, you look at the mycorrhiza association of the fungi and the microbes that are in that fungi, and you find that they're the same as us. We're living at a time where we're about to discover that we are part of nature, incontrovertibly. How exciting is that? Squamish will be the first ever scientific institution led by Native Americans to, bl to blend our empirical science with native science, or natively intuited science. Then we're going into a really exotic place called Morecambe. <laughs> Morecambe, Lancashire. Isn't it amazing how under our eyes, under our noses rather, is one of the most exciting places on Earth, Morecambe Bay. Ever been there? It is stunning. We're going to build probably the world's longest pier, and it's going to go underwater. And we're going to show anybody who goes there what is actually happening in that most extraordinary of Ramsar sites. Why? Because by turning what should have been an end of pier show into something that is revealing the majesty, the magic of the life cycles all working together in one place, I think is worth doing. Lancaster University think it's worth doing. Lancashire County Council have suddenly said, wow, that's really interesting. So, we're doing a lot of other projects too, but I, I've got a bit boring about this whole issue that I, I came here because I wanted to stop us permitting those who speak for the environment movement from wanting to play with the suits, predominantly suits. I say suits, not as a sexist thing, but because most of the people who are making the decisions about these things are guys with an unbelievable depth of stupidity and a mediocrity of vision that should actually end in some kind of tar and feathering for all. 
but I don't know, what, 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 should we talk about something now? I mean, I'm, I'm supposed to just talk and then I get asked questions, but after my doom-laden sort of... <laughs> I'm aware, it's really weird as you talk to people, you realise suddenly your voice has taken on a kind of weird monotone, like, like, like you're know, auditioning for the voice of God in some movie, you know. Um, but look, I would like to end by saying, I said before I was 62, I have never felt as excited as I feel today. I do, however, believe that all of us who believe the things that we do in this tent have got to understand that if we are to move to the next phase and to stop what we believe in being hijacked, we've got to become more muscular and less passive, which does not mean throwing bricks. It means actually bothering to learn about what we emotionally feel so that we can defend the territories that we think are really, really important going forward. Um, well, the voice of God will now stop. And if there, if there are any questions, please do ask them, and I will endeavour to have a... Maybe I'll stand up to answer the questions. That might li lighten my tone. It's, it's such a deep chair. Oh, heavens, the clean air of height. <laughs> well, thank you once again, Tim, for your eloquent awesomeness. And uh, <laughs> I j I'm just wanting to clarify. That, so you're saying walking away from the suits and the, the mainstream, so to speak, and just not engaging with that at all is the best thing we can do. But... But how uh, is what you're trying to do sort of a way to, I guess, make everybody fall in love with nature and find that side themselves rather than going into the belly of the beast and trying to convince people who just don't want to be convinced? Is that what you're hoping to do? Or, like, do we have enough time to kind of just start ignoring the Donald Trumps of the world and, and doing our own thing? Or is that just going to lead to them walking all over us and uh, <laughs> eventually, you know? Sorry, I haven't made myself clear at all. Um, thanks, Charlie, for that question. I am a capitalist. I am a complete, raw capitalist. I just believe that capitalism is a great system that has been hijacked by people with no moral compass. I actually believe that capitalism is a great system if it is managed to make profits for a purpose, a moral compass. That's what's actually screwing us up, is that people don't have a moral compass. The reason that Eden is now profitable, why everything I want to do is profitable. You know why? Because I don't want to be enslaved and grateful and supplicant to people who think they can drop the crumbs from their, their table to enable us to do what we need to do. And therefore, if you're going to do it, you've got to have an understanding of business. And therefore, making a profit out of business is not a bad thing, provided you make sure that that profit is disposed of in a particular way, dispersed in a particular way. And as for Donald Trump, I think he's the best thing that's happened for about 50 years. And I'm absolutely serious, totally serious. Who else, right? I was with um, one of my heroes last week called Mary Robinson, and she said, being in Paris for the signing by Laurent Fabius of the uh, 2015 climate change agreement, she said to see 3,000 people from all over the world start to clap at the moment of signature and then get up, punch the air and cheer, and then start to cry was the single most emotional thing she has ever seen in her life. She said, but it was nearly trumped, to make a pun, by Trump pulling out of the Paris Agreement and finding that within 24 hours, 35 American states had independently signed up to Paris. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. My, my favourite moment, of course, was when Trump said, I'm doing this for the folks of Pittsburgh. You know, and then the mayor of Pittsburgh says, please don't. Just don't. <laughs> I mean, you couldn't make it up, could you? No, no. On the contrary, I actually think, going into the belly of the beast, I actually think many of us should start companies, successful companies, learn how to run companies so that they can be run and organised so that the elements that we take out of the environment are properly accounted for in a, a, a traditional sense of accounting. Having said that, I don't want to be like that. Let me, let me tell you that, that there is one thing. Any of you interested in capitalism, let me share one thing. If you wanted to put probably as much as 50% right in the whole world of capital, there is one thing you needed to do, and it is so simple that even the governor of the Bank of England has privately admitted to me that he doesn't know why it hasn't been done. The reason it hasn't been done is because most people at the top of, of, of business are so establishment, they honestly do believe that the rules of business they're engaging with were handed down to Moses and they're unchangeable. One simple thing is that with every, when you start a limited liability company, if you were, give, if you were allocated one share, 
for us, the nation, the right to be a limited liability company, one share, would mean that auditors would have to audit every company every year for their impact on the commons. In my view, and I hope there are none of them in this audience, the most treacherous, obscurantist, completely mediocre profession the world has ever seen, and in my view, I would strip them of the word professional, I really would, are the auditors, the big four. If they were a true profession, they would, in their audarying, the Latin for listening, they would be listening to our interests. But they are a craven bunch of supine people who are for sale. And they dare to call themselves a profession on a parallel with me medicine or anything else. They are not. <laughs> so, this may be the last time you see me in public before I go by in bars. <laughs> um, so. I, I totally agree with your recommendation. We go out and, and make sure we understand you know, the science and, and the, the facts behind what we believe in. Um, I was browsing web the other day and saw some videos which are obviously misinformation. Have you got any guidance on how we can distinguish between something that's giving us real facts and what is you know, propaganda from the fossil fuel industry, for example? Um, I could give you some very boring guidance on how to make it, uh, starting with our own education. But the second thing I would say is we have a duty, we have a duty to also listen to what other people are saying. Because the weird thing in an algorithm-led world of social media is we get fed the things that preach to our own prejudice. So our prejudice will get deeper and deeper and deeper. What happens if some of the things we believe in are wrong? Are we open-minded enough to listen to them possibly being wrong? I know how prejudiced I am. I'm completely prejudiced to say that how open-minded I am. That's how prejudiced I am. I have an open mind. How dare you? There's a great piece of graffiti not far from here on a wall as you go over the Severn Bridge into Wales. It says, some open minds should be closed for repair. <laughs> and, um, I would suggest, I would suggest a really cool thing to do when you leave here, I've, I've just had a go at it myself, is to do a, a blank slate on oneself and just pick through why you believe things and is it a really good thing or is it, is it lazy, are we lazy too? Or has the world moved on to a different place and we're holding on to a view which is comfortable because we haven't shaken it up? Um, it's a bit like my mum getting divorced. My mum said to me after her divorce, she said, I've never liked bridge. I said, what? You played bridge twice a week for 35 years. I know. I never thought to question it. She's now come out real big time and admitted she doesn't like alcohol. And she's been drinking like a fish since I've known her. No, I'm saying that as a light, bit of light-hearted banter. I, 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 I am intrigued to read what other people write who have views that are not concurrent with what I currently think I have. I spent... I spent um, uh, 24 hours in the company of somebody who's one of the most likable men I have ever met in my life and I didn't share a single view in common. I could find no common ground because everything I said, it's like that. He said, but you could turn it round and look at it like that. And it was really, it was really difficult. It's really difficult when you're being friendly and not, you know, like Yabu sucks, that there are an awful lot of things where there are genuinely two or three different ways of looking at it. And I think if we're going to be serious people, as opposed to just we're part of a sheepy, sheepy group, we've got to actually open up to find out what we believe in today rather than what we believed in 10 years ago and what's going to be effective. You see, I believe that part of the environment movement should start to write pictures of let's all burn the world. Humour. Do you know, I, this is the honest truth, if I had to spend the rest of my life on a desert island with most of the environmentalists I've met, I'd prefer to drill my teeth without anaesthetic. Jesus, that sanctimonious, you know, you know, I know what's right. I hate it, don't you? In truth, I hate it. It's a bit like a moral superiority, I know. You don't know, but I know. It's in the core of my being, I was born with this. Sorry, I could go on a rant, I'll stop, I'll stop. Um, I, I love all these big projects that are going to 
bring people to the magic of extraordinary parts of this planet and it's a bit like watching David Attenborough and seeing all these extraordinary things that happen with animals that you can't see around you. But uh, I wonder if you've come across the term re-enchantment. I think what we need is to, to enable people to look at what's around us with different eyes and bring back the magic and actually uh, decorate trees. You know, there are lots of uh, lovely soppy traditions that actually uh, talk about the magic of what's around us. How do we get that back? You know, I like the word. I like the word re-enchantment. I, I think there are a bunch of trees would think that they've done a pretty good job on decorating themselves, actually. But, yeah. um, but, but no, no, I'm just putting, putting, putting your leg. The most important hour of my life if I'm allowed to exclude those domestic moments, which one is supposed to put at number one, two, you know. But the most, the most magic moment of my life was when the guy who was the boss of the Lost Gardens of Heligan for me said, would I give him an hour? And he said, I'll change, your, I'll change your worldview in one hour if you promise to do what I say. You know what he did? He took me, I don't know if any of you have been to Heligan, but he took me to the East Lawn and he pegged out one meter square and he put a chair at one side, he said, I want you to look at that one meter square as if the devil himself is going to come out and kill you. I want you to really be obsessive. I want you to be exhausted at the end of one hour. And I said, all right. So I sat there and I looked at this bit of field. And for the first 10 minutes, I was just getting cross. All you see is grass, isn't it? It's grass. But then suddenly, your eyes pick up on the essence of grassness. And you start to see the different grasses. And then. Once you get used to seeing it in a new way, you suddenly see a couple of insects, and then you get used to insects. It's a bit like, you know, those paintings in the 70s with dots, and people would say to you, can you see the elephant in the middle of it? And I never could. I could never see the elephant in the middle of it. But in this case, I got element of grassness, and I got element of insects, and then I saw small mammals. And I thought, how is it possible? I have walked here day after day. <laughs> exactly. Um, <laughs> Um, I've walked here for, for, for about 15 years, and I've walked in nature for since my birth, and I've never looked at it like this. And it's extraordinary. Two things happen. Two, thi two, th two things happen. It's just, no, it's absolutely charming. Um, it, um, it's completely made me lose my thread, but, you know. Um, no, no, two things happen. One is the sense of extraordinariness in what you're seeing. The second is it makes you very paranoid about walking through a field again because you feel like a serial killer. You know, you can't put your feet anywhere. But, see, but, but you're actually right. That, that's why um, the giant sequoias are so amazing, and that's why we're going to be building a tree house in the top of those giant sequoias, 275 feet up. Because one way out, you look, at, you look out over Sequoia National Park, and the other way, you see Death Valley. Is there ever a better metaphor of what's in front of us? It is the most astonishing thing. Um, so I, I think re-enchantment is, 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 is absolutely right. I think uh, recalibration of the mind and re-enchantment of the natural world are totally crucial, totally crucial. So yes, I salute you for that. Tim, uh, I'm going to be completely cheeky and take a question myself. I thought it would be nice that a woman speaks as well, ladies. Um, I'm really up for social enterprise and things making a profit and having their own legs so they are sustainable and not begging for crumbs um, and something we try and do here at the Seed Festival. Um, for me, when I, my journey into, the, you know, into working in ecology and the ecological movement, I had to put my deep green hippie in the closet and be serious <laughs> and put on trousers um, and, and really sort of hide my love, you know. And it's been a real relief to be able to come and do something like this where, you know, the passionate uh, person in the world can do things and show their love and those things can come together. And, you know, for me, you really encapsulate someone who has been shameless in showing their love. And, and how can you, you know, how can you inspire us to, a lot of us work between worlds and have mm. that thing where, okay, for this meeting I have to pretend I'm not this, <laughs> or they won't take me seriously. They won't take my love seriously. So I'd just like you to speak on how you've managed to overcome some of those moments. That's really difficult. I think, I think what, uh, this goes back to what I was saying earlier about muscularity. It's if you, 
use the sort of language we might use, but you don't use it as if it's tailored into kind of hippie speak. Do you know what I mean? There's a, there's a, a form of language which, if I'm in business, for example, I will never work with someone who talks about centers of excellence, working out of the box, joined up thinking, leading edge, cutting edge, bleeding edge. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know that people who use those words and how innovative and creative they are, they will be, the, the absence of all of those things will be immediately visible in the people saying them. And I think one of the things about being loose with your language, oh, I love nature and all the rest of it, is really different to saying, I am completely convinced not only intuitively, but science is supporting me about the interconnection of all things. And I feel connected because I'm awake and I want to be more and more awake and I want to observe things. Now, be aware of a number of things that, that science and art share one thing, which is if you look at it like a wishbone, it is observation. And most of us could benefit an awful lot from learning to observe more. Observing more and listening more are probably two of the greatest pieces of advice, advice you get. But you know what's really interesting? I was at um, DeepMind last week, at the Google um, AI outfit. You know who they're buying at the moment? They don't want programmers anymore. They've suddenly realized that what the future needs is ecologist. ecologists. They are buying ecologists and offering huge salaries to ecologists because they've suddenly realized that a binary system of algorithmic uh, uh, function is not going to give you the interrelatedness on about three or four dimensions. Now, that is really interesting. Our time is coming. It is. You see, once people have got added up two plus two plus two, and they get do that, and they, you still don't get what you want. What we're talking about is something like it's the same ludicrous thing. When I talk to companies, right, and you have a chief executive, you know, I love that phrase, chief executive. It makes you feel so. I don't know what it makes you feel, but like a ponce, really. But um, and you have a straight line down to the weighing scales of authority where you have a marketing director, sales director, finance, all those directorships, and next to them you've got those clusters like grapes of people they're in authority over. But it's all like kids whistling to stop crocodiles biting their toes under the bed at night. It, they aren't in control. You know what, I, mean, I run, you may know this about me, but I run Eden like we're a, a pack of wolves. I don't do this, chief, we have chief executives, but that's just to make other people happy. The truth is that we do some weird stuff like, if I have a good idea or other, someone else has a good idea, we all go somewhere. And everybody says, how inefficient is that? You're just so alternative. And I go, OK, is it inefficient? I go with four, my four top people. We fly to America. We meet someone. I like the idea. I say, do you guys like the idea? And they go, yeah. We go, right, let's do it. Bang. What do you do? You, t you send someone over to America. You have a long conversation. They come back. They write a report. It goes to the board. They all approve it. Then you go back. Then you go back. You take a team. You do a due diligence. And probably by the time that they've lost the will to live, you haven't done the deal. That is why most of the big companies in the world are already dying, because they build in the atrophy of wanting to be a grown-up. And that is what makes people like me dangerous in a mild way, because if you've run something that has been profitable and is, well, is profitable and is successful, they can't describe you as other. The way we are reduced to being impotent is by people feeling comfortable to say, look, they dress funny, they've got funny hippie shit ideas, they're other. It is really dangerous for them when you can speak their language. And we can. But the same thing about social enterprise, at the risk of you throwing things at me, I, Eden is a social enterprise, and it's for too long it has been seen as one of the leading social enterprise, enterprises. And the reason is there is a sickness at the heart of it where all sorts of people who want to think that they are enterprising thinks it's enough to run their NGO, whatever, with the word enterprise in it. I think that a lot of people deserve a slapping from a wet mackerel. Honestly, there are too many mediocre people running organizations for themselves to make themselves feel better, but their organizations are making not a hapeth a difference. Not a hapeth, because they're crap at running them. I believe if you're a good social entrepreneur, you ought to be able to run any company anywhere because you know what you're doing. And we let a lot of people get away with it, with motherhood and apple pie sentiment and the rest of it. If you want to run a business in which people are working for you and their lives and livelihoods depend on you being good, for God's sake, be professional enough to learn it. I'm sorry I feel angry about it, but when I was in the music industry for 10 years, the thing that used to get right up my nose was artists. I'm an artist. I, I, I don't do business. Say, so, okay, well, we'll rip you off then, shall we? <laughs> shall we? Because you don't care. Idiots. Idiots. It's such a soft-headed perspective. I think everybody in this audience ought to understand business. 
Because the moment you understand business, you'll realize there's no mystique. And also, many of you will realize you're bloody good at it. Now you've looked at it, you go, oh, I can do all that. But it's been hidden in language and processes and things which make it obscure. So that was my rant over. So don't be two people, become one. Mm. Or be a kind of, I don't know, camouflage schizophrenic. <laughs> Tim Smith, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much.